I've tried to put information into this talk. There's a little bit of the research, a little bit about some of the um, recent studies that myself and, and my colleagues have done, but also then trying to turn that into practicalities for you working in an allergy clinic. So, I'm going to have to use the mouse, aren't I? There we go. So, we all know what food allergy is. We know roughly what prevalence rates are, even though we know that they're different in different countries. Um, they might be even different within the UK, within different areas of the UK. But what's really fascinating about food allergy, and particularly from a psychological perspective, is just what a unique chronic condition it is. Because somebody who suffers from food allergy is generally well. They don't have symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. But what they live with is the risk of having something that actually might kill them. Even though that risk is very small, it is still there. As Hazel said earlier, we don't live in a risk-free environment. And, um, and one of the struggles I have with when I'm um, talking to parents in particular about food allergy is although that risk of their child dying is very, very tiny, it is there. And I can't say to them that it would never, ever happen. So we have patients who are very well, most of the time, but they have this risk that they might at some point eat something by mistake that gives them really nasty symptoms and sometimes life-threatening ones. So that's why it seems to be creating such big levels of anxiety, um, particularly in our parents. So, and, and that's why the management is such a burden, because we can't avoid eating. We could avoid having a cat or a dog if that's what we're allergic to, but we can't avoid actually eating food. Um, and we know that protein in food hides. We can't see it. So it's really hard then to actually identify whether there's something in there that's going to cause the symptoms. So it has a big effect on people's lives, um, and it has an effect on people's quality of life. Oh, did the wrong one. That's it. So there's been some reviews of the literature um, if we think back to perhaps before the year 2000, there's virtually nothing in the literature on food allergy in terms of psychological aspects, you know, quali particularly quality of life. Almost nothing. There's some stuff on asthma, um, but not much. From the year 2000 onwards, we've had this massive explosion of literature and a big rise in um, interest in this area, which is fantastic. So we've had that much literature now on looking at things like quality of life that we are now starting to see review articles coming out. So I would always suggest that's your first port of call if you wanted to have a look at the latest knowledge about sort of quality of life and food allergies to start looking at some of the review articles. So Markland published one in 2007. Uh, myself uh, and the group down in Southampton published one in 2010, which didn't seem that long ago, but it's now six years ago. So, and there's a lot that's come out in the last six years. Um, and Maru et al, um, they published one in 2014. Um, all of these looking at quality of life, and um, a couple of them, particularly myself and Amanda Cummings and, and the guys down in Southampton, we looked at also things like anxiety and depression and stress. And all of those reviews have concluded that food allergy has an impact on quality of life, um, but there are some variations. So sometimes we find that our children or parents might have better quality of life in certain aspects. So quite often, physical quality of life, they report is actually better than general population norms. Not surprising, because food allergy doesn't affect your physical quality of life. You can walk down to the end of the street and back, you can get yourself dressed. Food allergy doesn't affect that at all. And of course, the people who are taking part in these studies, who do we see taking part in these sorts of studies? Well, who are the parents like? Very concerned. They're very concerned, so they're motivated to take part. But what about their demographics? Mothers. Mothers? Generally white, middle class, middle class high socioeconomic status. Parents who have actually navigated their way through our healthcare service to get a referral and then are picked up a new research project and said, would you like to take part? Yes, I'll take part. So if, if you ask them about their quality of life, of course it's going to be quite high compared to people who actually we don't see in allergy clinic. 
So there is some variation in some of the results, but generally uh, we're finding that there is a big impact on quality of life and there's also quite high levels of things like worry and anxiety. In some cases there's levels of depression as well. Um, and this affects patients of all ages, so it affects children and adolescents um, in different ways and it affects adults, although there is less research done on adults, as we were talking about earlier. Um, they seem to be a forgotten group. Um, adults still have allergy, um, but not a lot of research has been done on adults um, at the minute. And parents. So a lot of the research that I'm involved in is looking at parents. Oh, I keep forgetting the keys don't work. OK, so we know what the causes of this impact are. We've had a lot of talks today which have gone through these sorts of things. Um, this unpredictability of food allergy, um, the fact that eating affects so many different social activities that we might do, um, including going on holiday in this country or abroad. Trying to read food labels in this country is bad enough. Trying to read them in a different language is even harder. Parties and school trips, those sorts of things. All, all that, that sort of area of, of life, which is a big part of having a good quality of life, um, is affected. We're finding that mums tend to be more affected than fathers, and um, mostly it's the mums who tend to be doing the shopping and the reading of the food labels and doing the cooking. Um, so they do tend to be affected, but mums also tell me that they're often having to treat the father like another child um, and constantly remind the father, if they're taking the, the child out, have you got their adrenaline pen, have you got their uh, medication, um, remember that, that they can't eat this, remember that they can eat that. Um, so fathers sometimes don't um, take things quite as, either don't take things quite as seriously or think they can cope, think they can manage and mums tend to actually um, report being much more burdened with, with the allergy than the fathers are. And we also have some economic issues as well. So um, Hazel told us earlier about how much longer it takes to do your food shopping. But there's also a dietary cost depending on what sorts of alternative foods you might want to be buying. And I know of, um, you know, I've talked to quite a lot of mums who, when they had a child who had a lot of allergies, they didn't go back to work. So they stayed at home to look after their child. So some of the um, work that's been done on this um, is both quantitative and qualitative. And I find that actually the qualitative work where we're, we're um, looking at interviewing parents or teenagers or children actually gives you a lot more detail than the quantitative work where you're just looking at numbers. Now, I'm a quantitative psychologist. I like numbers. I like sitting there with a data set and looking at statistical differences. But actually, when you look at what people say, you actually get a lot more detailed information. So there's a couple of studies here, one by Mandel and colleagues where they were looking at parents of 17 children with peanut allergy, um, all having a history of anaphylaxis. What they found difficult was the lack of information. And they found that not having a lot of information, particularly at diagnosis, increased their anxiety and increased their uncertainty about what to do about managing an accidental reaction. Now, I, I work with a lot of allergy clinics, and I know you all have good allergy management packs. You all give your parents and your patients lots of information. But do you check that they understand it? And do you have the resources to follow them up a couple of weeks later and say, have you understood everything we've told you? Are there any questions that you want to ask? Have you read the information we've given you? Because a lot of the time they won't take stuff in in clinic. Um, it's a stressful environment. They've just been told their child has potentially life-threatening food allergy. What else will they take in? Very little at that time. So even though you might give them information, they might not understand it. They might not read it. They might have lots of questions. And of course, you don't have the resources to go and follow them up. Um, another study also with parents sh um, reported that high levels of worry were around their child having an anaphylactic reaction. Um, and of course, this is not surprising, and this is what a lot of my mums I talk to tell me, that it's, it's that worry about what to do. You know, my, I've managed my child's allergy really well. They've never had an anaphylactic reaction, but I know that they've got, they're at risk of it. I've been given an adrenaline pen. But would I recognise it if I saw it? 
and if they did have an anaphylactic reaction, what would I do? And there's a lot of misconception about what an anaphylactic reaction looks like. So one mum I was talking to said, well, I, I just assumed that my child would immediately collapse on the floor, immediately be unconscious, um, I would have seconds to react, and, and I can't remember how to use my, the adrenaline auto-injector. She had an EpiPen. I can't remember how. I've not even got it out of the box in, you know, since I was shown how to use it in a 10-second demo at the allergy clinic years ago. So it's not surprising that there's, there's lots of worry around, around that. So because um, a lot of the parents were talking to me about their confidence in these things and their worries and their uncertainties, we thought, does parental confidence, has that got something to do with how well they manage allergy and how much it, then it might impact on quality of life? So if you've got good confidence in being able to manage a reaction in your child, is that going to equate to better quality of life for you and your child and your family? So as being psychologists, we have a specific word for confidence, which is self-efficacy. We like to have our own little terms that nobody else understands. Um, but you probably have heard of something like self-efficacy. It's, it's not that uncommon. Um, but it is a term that we use to describe somebody's belief in their, um, or their confidence in their ability to do something. So we decided to have a look at this in people with food allergy because if we can identify that um, self-efficacy is important, there are ways in which we can improve self-efficacy and we can improve confidence. And self-efficacy is related to things like past experiences. So if I've done something well in the past, I feel um, more confident in being able to do it in the future. Um, we can model, so we can, um, people can watch somebody do something, like so you could demonstrate how to use an adrenaline pen and that, or, or how to manage your allergy in an effective way and that modelling can help improve somebody's self-efficacy. And we can use things like feedback um, and persuasion, um, but it's also affected by emotional states as well. So how anxious you're feeling about something might affect how um, much confidence you feel in being able to actually do something. So we developed a scale looking at self-efficacy, which is, um, it's been published and it's available and if you want to use it in your clinics, you can ask me for a copy and I will gladly send you one. It's really easy to use, really easy to fill in. Um, so we developed that and validated that and then we, um, the anaphylaxis campaign helped greatly in this, this study actually by um, advertising it for us. So parents could go online and fill in the questionnaires and we had 434 parents fill it in, which is a huge number really for, for a study like this. Um, and they filled in our self-efficacy scale, they filled in a quality of life scale, um, they filled in something to measure their sort of general mental health and the food allergy independent measure which has been used in a number of studies which looks at the parents perceived <coughs> likelihood that their child is going to have a severe reaction. So these are the demographics, um, I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but mostly they had children who were around about nine years of age, um, uh, fairly, so mostly males rather than females in terms of children, but you can see there who filled them in, all the mums. 94.7% of mums filled them in. And as we find this in virtually every study we do, it's mums that will fill stuff in. You have to specifically go to dads and say, here, fill this in for us in order to get dads to do it. So all the mums, um, and although this was self, the, the parents were reporting that their child had uh, a clinical diagnosis, um, but we're pretty sure that you know, most of them did. We see here that almost all of them were carrying an adrenaline auto-injector. So when we look at our self-efficacy scale, it's just got 21 items and it's just scored on up to 100. So it's, a, it's like a percentage. So um, you just fit it in to say how confident you feel in being able to do things. And then we just work out the mean score. So every subscale has a score then out of 100. And parents were least confident in managing social activities, so particularly going out, um, eating, sort of school trips, those sorts of things, and seeking information. So actually getting information about food allergy, that was what they were least confident in doing. They also had quite pretty high 
general health questionnaire score. So they're all scoring over the cutoff for being at risk of being diagnosed with a mental illness. Um, but of course, that's the mean. So you've got a big variation there. Not everybody's, not everybody will have will have scored that. Um, so we looked at relationships with quality of life in our parents. So greater quality of life. Then, so if you've got, you've got better quality of life, this was related to greater self-efficacy. So the more confident you are in managing your child's al allergies, the more, uh, the, the better the quality of life that you've got for your family. So we use the parental burden scale, which looks at um, parents' beliefs about the quality of life for their child and their family. Um, also better mental health and also um, related to um, a perceived lower likelihood of a severe reaction. So if you don't think your child's um, likely to have a very severe reaction, then you're reporting better quality of life. We also found that parents who were older um, also had a better quality of life. Parents of children who were older um, and, and those who had fewer allergies. Now, the fewer allergies thing is something that comes up time and time again. The more allergies you, your child has, the bigger impact it has on quality of life. And that's coming out across studies. But age seems to be different. Some studies are finding that as a child gets older, quality of life gets worse because they're wanting to go out and do more things. But we found actually that as a child got older and as a parent got older, quality of life got better. And maybe it's because they're learning ways of managing well. Um, and the longer that your child has an allergy, the, more, the, the better you are at, at managing that. And you've incorporated it into your family routine. But it's something that we need to look at because different studies are finding different things. But what was really interesting is, and, and this is coming up in a number of studies that we're looking at, is it doesn't seem to be peanut that's causing the main problem, it's egg and milk. Is that, is that surprising for you guys or is that something that I can see Hazel actually going, I agree with that, that's not surprising to me. What about other people? Egg and milk is the thing that's really affecting quality of life. I guess because egg and milk is in so many different foods and it's not the may contain traces of egg and milk is it so it's may contain traces of nuts which we know from threshold studies may be um you know they're eating that and we know they're eating that they'll look at may contain and go it's fine i'll eat that and they'll be fine but for egg and milk it's actually in the foods and so it takes especially if you've got egg and milk that you're having to try and avoid, it's having a big impact. So we're, we're finding that across a, a number of recent studies. So then we looked to see um, what might predict quality of life. So the only things that actually, um, that, pre that were related to quality of life in terms of the food allergy um, characteristics um, and demographic characteristics were the egg allergy, the number of allergies, the age, eczema, anaphylaxis, hospitalisation, the things that you actually are coming up in most studies. But we put these into a regression model um, and all we could explain in terms of scores on quality of life was 7%. So it was a significant model but we could only explain 7% of the variance in scores on quality of life on that step one there with just those. We put in self-efficacy, general health and people's perceptions of the severity of allergy and that shot up to 46%. A massive jump in how much quality of life we can explain. So it doesn't seem to be characteristics of the food allergy at all that's really having a big impact on quality of life, although obviously it is, but it's other stuff. How confident you are in managing it. That is a really big, that was the biggest predictor there. These are uh, beta values, and the biggest one we've got is for self-efficacy, 0.45. That seems to be the, the, the biggest thing in being able to explain quality of life. So that just says what, what I've said there. So we just looked at self-efficacy on its own. On its own, 35% of variance in quality of life has been explained. And what seems to be most important is managing social activities and precaution and prevention of allergic reaction. If you're confident in, in managing social activities for your child that involves food and you're confident in being able to um, do things to prevent an allergic reaction um, and take precautions to manage it, then you have better quality of life. So self-efficacy seems to be something that's really important and we need to um, think about interventions that might 
improve self-efficacy for our parents. <laughs> so, from this study then, it seems to be really clear that confidence in managing your child's food allergy is important. It was the biggest predictor of quality of life in our study. Um, it was also associated with better mental health. So if parents had um, better self-efficacy, they also had better scores on the mental health scale. So we need to be thinking about how we can improve parent self-efficacy. So how can we reduce this impact on, on our families and how can we improve quality of life? There are some interventions now that are uh, starting and there's some that have been published. Um, there's an educational one by um, Scott Shearer, um, which um, the website is there and you can go on there's um, free materials there um, which can be used um, see this is American so I've not actually had a look had a, an in-depth look at those materials but that study showed that actually if you provide information this can um, help um, parents manage manage their allergy better but I know as a psychologist and you guys will all know that if you actually just provide information does that is that going to help? If you just tell somebody what to do, are they going to be able to do it? No. We all know we should be eating five portions of fruit and veg. We all know how much alcohol we're supposed to be having. We all know we should be going and doing lots of exercise. Do we do it? No. So education on its own is, is not enough. Baptist did a self-regulation intervention. This was aimed at helping parents identify concerns with their child um, and then contemplate if that concern occurred, so a reaction, what would they do? What are their coping mechanisms? Um, and this also helped improve certain aspects of quality of life as well. So um, in this particular study, having this type of intervention where you have had a nurse talk you through the concerns and identify what coping strategies you would use if it happened, um, helped to reduce anxiety related to food allergy, uh, reduced frustration felt by um, others not knowing anything about food allergy, reduced worry about not being able to help a child, and reduced um, feelings of being frightened about a reaction. Um, but it's, um, it was quite a low-powered study, so they didn't have many participants um, in, their, in their study. And it's also, it, it's probably something that you're not going to have capacity to do in your clinic. Are you going to have nurses trained in self-regulation intervention being able to sit with your patients and then follow them up on telephone a few weeks later and check with them whether they're going to, you know, probably not is the answer to that one. Um, Poloni uh, has published um, a couple of years ago now um, a very short just sort of letter to the editor looking at psychological treatments um, and what um, they had um, patients coming through and, and reported what they were asking for psychological treatments for. So a lot of them were around sort of emotional issues and social problems, difficulty managing food allergy and eating problems. Not many for, were for sort of behavioural problems in the child. So most, mostly it was around sort of the emotional things and just some practical tips to actually help manage food allergy. Uh, and they reported that for, for most of those families, um, they were coping better after they had whatever psychological treatment they went for. Um, because it's only a letter to, letter to the editor, there's not a lot of information in there. So I don't know what psychological treatments they had um, or what they've got access to. But I suspect it's CBT type um, interventions. So this is what I've been working on and also Audrey Dungalvin has done some work on CBT um, with children and I've been working with parents. Um, do we need to explain what CBT is? Is everybody pretty, anybody not heard of CBT or not know what it is? Or doesn't want to say because nobody's putting their hand up. <laughs> So hopefully you all know it's a psychological therapy, uh, quite a short-term one, so you know, you're not in therapy for years, um, and it focuses on here and now, and it looks at emotions, behaviour, symptoms, and cognitions and thoughts, and it um, helps people develop better coping strategies um, in order to feel better about things and feel better about themselves. So Audrey's been working on um, a CBT type intervention with um, children and adolescents, aiming to increase their confidence in coping. So again, this confidence thing is really important uh, and increasing their quality of life. So she saw children um, between six and 16 years old. 
and um, her intervention group was um, just one hour of CBT per week for six weeks. And she found significant improvement in quality of life from baseline to the follow-up at six months. Um, their expectation of adverse events decreased, which is excellent, and their expectations of effectively treating themselves increased, and their perceptions of control increased as well. So I've been doing something similar with parents. Um, this is an open access paper, so the, um, the link is there, and I'll give the Anaphylaxis campaign, I'll give them a copy of the slides. So if you wanted to read the paper in full, if you're really interested, um, then you can do. So the aims of this study were to use CBT to see whether it was relevant for our parents, because it hadn't really been used before for parents of children with food allergy. Um, was it appropriate? Could we improve quality of life? And could we reduce things like stress and depression and worry? So that's what CBT is, as I've just very, very briefly explained. And it's got really good evidence base for things like anxiety, panic and worry, all the things that we see in our parents of children with food allergy and other long-term conditions as well. Um, also, post-traumatic stress disorder. There are some mentions in the literature saying that if parents have a child that's gone into, uh, uh, had an anaphylactic reaction and ended up in hospital, then they um, often get PTSD-type symptoms, so flashbacks um, and feeling very worried and scared and remembering that, that event very, very clearly. So, and it's in the NICE guidelines as well for things like um, anxiety and depression. So I thought it might work for our, our parents. So we've got... I, this was just a little pilot study, so it's like a, almost like a proof of concept study. Is it appropriate and does it work? So I had um, five mums who took part in CBT and we had six controls. They filled in a huge raft of psychometric scales um, to look at lots of things including stress, quality of life, anxiety, depression and worry. Um, and we took all the measures at baseline for both groups and then at six weeks and then at 12 weeks. Um, so the controls were all mums who said, I'm feeling fine, I'm, I'm okay, I'll fill in some questionnaires for you, but I don't need CBT. And all the mums who wanted, to, wanted CBT were like, I'm really not feeling fine, can I have CBT, please? So they, were, they selected themselves into the study, really. Um, these are their demographics, and I don't want to go through it in detail, but I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, one is, these are not all children who've got peanut allergy. So again, we're seeing things like milk and egg. But also, these aren't mums whose children have only just been diagnosed. These are mums whose children have been diagnosed for around about five years. And they've been managing quite well as their child's young, and now their child's getting a bit older, becoming a bit more independent, wanting to go out with their mates, maybe going from primary school to secondary school. They're suddenly starting to panic and worry and, and not being able to manage. So that, I found, was quite interesting. So what do we find? So this is um, just sort of snap some snapshots of data before I sort of tell you about a case study. So um, this is our CBT group and control group at the start of the intervention. Now all the, C no, all the control group, when I did all of their scores, they were all fine actually. They scored well below the cutoffs for things like stress, anxiety, depression. Um, so actually they, they had, when they said I'm fine, I'm doing okay, they were fine, they were doing okay, which is, which is great. And it does show us that not every parent who has a child with food allergy struggles because we know that a lot of parents actually do very well, manage very well. But our parents, our mums who wanted CBT all had worse physical and psychological quality of life, worse food allergy specific quality of life, higher anxiety, higher, de higher depression and poorer scores on GHQ12. And some of the other things were only just missing significance as well. So things like stress, because we've only got really tiny numbers. We've only got five, five cases and six controls. I was amazed to find any significant differences, to be, to be honest, but we still did. Um, and then at the end, this is our CBT group at the start and at the end. And they had better physical quality of life. Now, that surprised me. Um, and I struggled with, why would they have better physical quality of life? Might be because they're sleeping better. So some of the, phys 
a part of physical quality of life is good quality sleep. If you're worrying less and you're managing your child's allergy better, you're probably sleeping better. That might be a reason. But they had better food allergy related quality of life. They had less worry, less anxiety, less depression, and their scores on GHQ12 went down. So, yay! CBT worked, <laughs> um, which is brilliant. So, let's just tell you about a case study. So, here we've got Adam, he's six, um, allergic to peanut milk and egg. Uh, and asthma, but asthma is really well controlled. So what I've done is tried to draw your eye to sort of the underlined bits here, which are all the bits that are really we focused on in CBT. So here, Adam's mum, Jane, she feels that she is solely responsible for his allergies and making sure that he does not have an accidental reaction. Okay. So she does all the, all the food shopping, all the reading food labels, all the cooking herself. She doesn't let anybody else look after Adam. She doesn't let him go anywhere without her apart from school. She can't trust anybody else to know what to give Adam to eat. It has to be her. And if he does go anywhere, he has to have his, his own food that he takes. They don't go out to eat, or they do very, very rarely, and it's places that, that they know well. She thinks the risk is too high. The risk of him having an allergic reaction is too high. It's just not worth it. Um, and she's really anxious a lot of the time. She's anxious that he might see, eat something that will kill him um, if she's not around to make sure he's okay. And terrified of giving adrenaline. Isn't sure how to do it. What if she gives him adrenaline he doesn't need it? Is that going to hurt him? So I find that this is quite common in, in the parents I talk to. One, they have a lot of misconceptions. Um, they have a lot of um, wrong, sort of wrong beliefs about food allergy. Um, one parent said to me, we can't go abroad. They don't know anything about food allergy abroad, especially America. They don't know anything about anything. No, they, won't, they won't even know what allergy is in America, so we can't go there. And we, we can't go to Europe. And I was like, ah, <laughs> I think you'll be all right. <laughs> um, they probably know more than we do, and their labeling's probably better. So um, there are, and things like um, breastfeeding. Did I have something or not have something when I was breastfeeding? or when I was weaning, did I do something wrong there? So there was a lot of things that we had to clear up. Um, but you can really see the unhelpful thoughts. One, I am solely responsible for my child not having a reaction. Only me, nobody else has to be me. I can't trust anybody else. The risk of him having a reaction is really high and I might hurt him if I give him adrenaline and he doesn't need it. So not surprising that all of these sorts of thoughts make you feel scared, worried, anxious, guilty. There's a lot of guilt. What have I, have I done something or not done something which means he has an allergy? That was a lot of guilt around that. There's also a lot of guilt about, I'm not letting him go to parties like all of his mates. We're not going on holiday like we should be. I'm restricting his life. I'm a bad mum. Um, so lots of restricted social life, not going on holiday and allergy just taking over. So allergy, we live our life around the allergy. So what helped? So these are just some of the things that we did. Um, one was to practice releasing some control. So a lot of the parents find it really hard to let go of some of that control um, and can't tolerate uncertainty. And so you have to practice with them letting some of that control go and tolerating some uncertainty. Um, so things like having trusted others who they will let them look after their child for small amounts of time and building that up, um, not being so prescriptive of like, this is what he has to eat for breakfast, this is what he has to eat for lunch, but being a little bit more, letting others make that, that choice a little bit more. Quite a lot of education, particularly around risk. So parents have no idea really what the risk is. So letting them know actually what the risk is um, and challenging those thoughts about chances of having allergic reaction. You know, your son hasn't had a low allergic reaction. No, you have been out to eat. Yeah. And he has been to other people's houses. Yeah. Has he had a reaction? No. So what are the chances of him having one? Probably quite small. So it's challenging those, those thoughts. Um, and then education about adrenaline. So, you know, if you give it and they don't need it, what's he going to get? Probably, as we saw from one of those slides, racy heart, feeling a bit shaky, but it's not going to hurt him. And I am right in saying this, aren't I? <laughs> 
I haven't been telling my parents the wrong thing. It isn't going to hurt them. Um, and, you know, it's better to, I think it's always better to give it if you think you need it rather than don't give it when you think you need it. Uh, and practice, practice with a trainer pen. Regular practice, because we know that parents forget, patients forget. So regular practice with their trainer pen. Um, did, did Nick, did you say first of every month? First of every month, get your trainer pen out, practice with it. But also, if your child, if you know, if you've got a parent and their child's old enough, get their child to practice with it, get their child to show their mates, get their mates to practice with it. And actually, most kids quite like that and they quite like showing their mates. Um, and it's just building that confidence and building the confidence in the children as well. Because I think if, if the parents start to feel that their child can make the right decisions to keep them safe, the parent then starts to feel a bit happier about that. So, to finish off, practical tips for clinic. Um, reducing anxiety. I know you will probably all give really good information out, but it's, it's, uh, it's checking that, that parents and patients understand that information. Making sure they've all got trainer pens and that they emphasise that they should be doing repeat training. Follow-up appointments if you can. Um, I know that um, for some, for adults, they're not followed up. Um, I know that some adolescents that we've spoken to have said, actually, I would quite like to go to the allergy clinic for follow-ups because then I know if I'm doing stuff right or wrong. I know if I've still got my allergy or not. Uh, and those uh, children who hadn't had follow-up appointments um, felt, uh, took more risks uh, and didn't feel as if they knew as much about, uh, about their allergy. Signposting to further support. So obviously the anaphylaxis campaign and the allergy wise courses as well. So any parent who joins, as Lynn said earlier, they get um, the course for free and the, and the HCP course is 90 pounds, is that? Is that still it's 90? It's cheaper than that if you're a professional member. And if you remember, it's cheaper. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, addressing risk. Uh, there are some really good papers out there published now about risk and about um, comparable risks so things like comparing the risk with winning the lottery or being hit by a car you've got actually more chances of being hit by a car than you are dying from a reaction to an anaphylactic reaction to food but you might find there are times when you do need to refer somebody um, so it, you might want to give them um, some questionnaires to fill in which might identify whether they are um, have really high anxiety levels or you can give our, our self-efficacy scale um, but if you see anybody who is has a really excessive worry excessive checking behavior can't understand levels of risk or won't accept it um, so there are some parents who won't accept their child has a food allergy I'm not accepting that diagnosis it's that's that's not it, my child doesn't have a food allergy um, particularly because it can't be cured um, although you know we, we do have the desensitisation programmes, but in general, you know, this is not something parents can fix. This is something parents have to manage, and sometimes parents can't um, accept that. And then extreme behaviour, like real hypervigilance, not eating outside of the home at all, unnecessarily restricted diet, those sorts of things you might pick up. I might think, actually, this might need something a bit more than I can do in clinic. Um, and I have been asked before about... How do you then tackle a referral? Um, because if you say to somebody, maybe you want to go and see one of the clinical psychologists, they go, I'm not bonkers, I'm not mad, I don't want to go and see a psychologist, what do I want to see a psychologist for? Um, so it's about trying to normalise those feelings. You know, these are normal feelings to have. It's normal to feel worried, it's normal to feel a bit out of your depth. Um, and seeing a psychologist just allows you time to talk about that gives you time, you won't be judged, um, there'll be lots of parents that have been helped in this way and they'll just give you some tips to be able to manage better. Um, now I know that most of you don't have a service you can refer to <laughs> either. Um, we're trying to set up in the Midlands, if people come from the Midlands, at Aston University where I work, um, a referral centre where I will be able to see a certain number of um, adult patients or parents um, for CBT, for food allergy, which um, we sh we, I'm hoping, talking to Nick, that we might have funding for at least for the coming year. Um, happy to see people from you know, anywhere on a private basis, and I do do private work. But there are some um, hospitals where they do have clinical psychologists that you can refer to, but there might be long waiting lists. 
Um, but sometimes you'll get a knockback on a referral because it's like uh, they don't meet certain criteria for being referred. So they might not meet the criteria for CAMS if it's a child or, you know, if you say food allergy, they go, that's physical, we don't do physical stuff. So if you do refer, it needs to, you need to make it clear that this is because of high, really high anxiety levels or stress or depression or worry because of a long-term condition. Um, otherwise, you might f struggle with referrals. I've, we have had conversations with that before in, with um, other clinicians. Okay, this is what our self-efficacy scale looks like. Um, it's really easy to fill in and it's really easy to score. So um, parents just read. So how confident am I in preparing to go out home with, with, with my child? How confident am I to plan to make sure my child's safe with friends, relatives or a babysitter? And it just gives you an idea and you f when parents fill it in, you can look at it and go, there's some low scores on here. This is, this is where they're struggling. This is where we need to perhaps give them a bit more information. Okay, and that's it. So, I've got thank yous for the Anaphylaxis campaign. Derby Children's Hospital, and Donna's here from Derby, they helped um, with recruitment for the C my CBT study, um, but lots of, lots of thank yous to research assistants and co-investigators as well. And thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, so, uh, I think... A lot of people won't have access to psychological no. services specific for food allergy. And I know in Cambridge, if we refer to CAMS, you know, they'll yeah. just get bounced straight back. Yeah. Um, so in your case study for that kid, a lot of the stuff on the left-hand panel on the cognitive behavioural therapy intervention actually sounded like a lot of stuff we do in clinic for the more yeah. anxious parents anyway. But, yeah. but obviously you do it in a more professional and, and <laughs> I have more time way. to do it. I'm not sure time. about... Yeah, but I just we, have more time. Many of us have um, people in our department who have the time, you know, perhaps um, uh, nurses, for example. Yeah. I mean, is there anywhere they can get help and is it appropriate for them to be trying to do this uh, on their own, as it were, if there's nothing else available? Um, yeah. And c can you design a package, for example, that can be used by non-psychology -psycholo practitioners? I'd <laughs> i get some funding. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd love to. Um, I mean, it's something that is in the back of my mind, is to try and maybe develop some sort of training package. Um, that could be used for health healthcare professionals, yeah. Because um, it'd be quite focused, and I think you'd probably find the issues yeah. are very similar for lots yeah. of different people. Yeah. Um, I said, does anyone have access to a psychologist? Does anyone sort of do the model that I'm suggesting, Lorraine? So just very recently, we got yeah. some uh, funding for a year's worth of a lovely psychologist. You were Evelina? Yes. Yeah. So, if yeah. Sessions are just absolutely wonderful, and we're looking at exactly the kind of things that you're already addressing. Yeah. And thank you for talking, it's superb. Thank you. It's Good. Well, I hope you get a permanent post, and yeah, you know that's amazing. the thing. We're all saying we're getting a psychologist for a year, but yeah. you know, what, what we well, need is permanent. Yeah, yeah. Show that. Yeah. Show that. Yeah. Demonstrate the case. case yeah, because yeah. yeah. I think I think one of the issues because we're trying to get some funding to do um, an, an online course for parents, mm -hmm. um, which is CBT based yeah. um, as a, as an intervention, and we're trying to get some funding for that. But one of the one of the issues is that there's been no no real studies doing looking at the cost, the psychological cost of food allergy. So there's quite a lot of stuff out there looking at the economic cost and the household cost. But how can we show NIHR that we can actually reduce costs to the NHS mm. from, from the, the psychological perspective? I think that if anybody has data on that, that we can put into our grant application, that, I mean, that, that would be really good. Mm. Is this something for the campaign to take up? I don't know. Maybe. Mm. We could discuss that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Rebecca. That's okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh,